Jesus
joy is found in communion with you. You're holding your beauty in knowing your truth in living a life that pleases your heart, responding with praises. So all And oh, how lovely is the King, and all of His glory is the Christ, who is holy, who was, and who And I've come to worship And I've come to fall down Seek only your face Laying down my crown And I've come to worship I've come to fall down His love
Oh, how lovely is the King in all his glory. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We thank you that you are the King who sits on the throne, Lord of all, ruler of all rulers, sovereign God. Father, we thank you so much that you sent your Son. We're grateful to be in your presence, Lord with an opportunity to worship you, to be reminded of who you are and what you've done for us, your love and your grace, your power, your majesty. How amazing your love is towards us, Lord. While we're yet sinners, Jesus, you died for us. We didn't deserve it, but you loved us that much. And your desire was to build a family. Here we are, your children tonight, Lord. And our prayer is that you would, by your spirit who lives in us, you would teach us. You would challenge us. You would comfort us. You would guide us. And that you would speak to us. So, Lord, we open our ears, we open our hearts, we open our minds to you. We invite you to to pour yourself into us that fruit might be born in us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was thinking as we were worshiping, you know, the the definition of worship that I like most is is all that we are responding to all that God is. Because we're very complicated creatures. You know, we have not only a mind, but an emotions and a will. You know, we can make choices, all these things. And, and uh, what worship is, is, is all of us, all parts of us, not only with our minds, but our emotions and our will, responding to all that God is. And he's immense. He's got so many attributes, so many aspects that uh, is all we can do is just kind of stand in awe and worship him. And so that's the beauty of worship. That's why worship is, we've, we've been worshiping, and we're going to worship right now when we look into the word. Uh, because our minds we give to God, you know, we open our ears, we say, Spirit, speak to us. We want to know what you have to teach us tonight. And so I always look forward to us gathering together and being able to do that. You know, one, one thing I did want to mention before we get started tonight is, you know, if you haven't been watching the news or anything like that, you realize that all of the COVID mandates are, are uh, you know, finding their way away, which probably, you know, we're happy about. Um, so I, I was thinking about it. The elders met this last week, and, and uh, you know, the, the thought that I had after our meeting was, you know, as, as COVID winds down, um, it's time for the church to rise up again. It's time for us to be the church right? And so, so uh, this, this is your first invitation, but you'll get a lot more information as we go on. But, but in a few weeks from now, we're going to be having a congregational meeting. Our thought was we'll have our, our worship service, and then after the service, we'll just spend some time talking about where we are, what, what's been going on, where, we're, where we see God taking us in the future, you know, pu- putting some of those pieces back together uh, just because of the fact that, you know what, okay, let, let's put those two years behind us now, and let's move on to what the Lord has for us, the new things that he has for us. We just did a couple weeks ago in men's Bible study, you know, the parable of the new wine, you know, you, you, got, you got to have a new vessel in order to be able to put the new wine in it. And so we're, we're looking forward to God doing that kind of thing in our midst. So I'm just telling you that that's going to happen. Like I said, you'll get a lot more details um, as the, the weeks approach. You know, the, I don't know if you've thought about it before, but there are really a lot of forces um, that shape our world, lots of forces. For instance, there are political forces uh, that can change the relationship between countries. Allies can become enemies. Enemies can become allies. I mean, it it literally can change the boundaries of countries like happened after World War II. Uh, These political forces get together and they draw lines and they say, okay, that's going to be you and this is going to be us. It shapes the way the world looks, the the way the world works. There are, there are military forces 
we are probably more accustomed to that idea now than we've been in a long time. But these forces can change peace into war in just an instant. And so we sit on pins and needles wondering what's going to happen with Russia and Ukraine. There are police forces. For some, the police bring a sense of security. For others, police bring a, a sense of fear. Uh, but, but it shapes the world. It shapes the way that we live. There are social forces. I mean, we, we're very accustomed to that. Forces that change our culture. So, so there are certain forces in our society, for instance, that determine who gets canceled today and, and who has the opportunity to, to express their understandings and their opinions. There are economic forces. I mean, when uh, the stock market is doing well and everything's to be stable and the economy is growing, then, then people have a, a general sense of you know, financial security. There's some peace in that. Uh, but if that all gets upended for a variety of reasons, and it can happen very quickly. You know, you think about the Depression in 1929, all of a sudden, people weren't so happy. Instead, people were jumping out of buildings to end their lives because they thought their entire existence was gone now that the market had collapsed. All of these are forces that shape the world that we live in, that, that make a difference into how it is that we live, how we worship, you know, what our, what our society is like. All of those are there. But there is one force that I could probably argue is the most powerful force in the whole world. The, the one force that, that can shape the world more than anything else. You know what that is? The tongue. Words are incredibly powerful. And if you just look through the annals of history, you know, we're all very familiar with words that were spoken at timely moments that made a difference in the lives of people, that made a difference in, the, in the, just the general sense of well-being in the world or, or aspirations or goals that, that people had. I mean, you might think of uh, Winston Churchill's words in World War II. He said, never give in, never give in, never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. And if you know the context of those words, you know that things were not going well for Britain at the time these words were spoken. And so Winston Churchill, a great leader, steps up and, and inspires his people to never give in in the midst of that kind of terrible, you know, war. And the reality is that the words inspired the, the British people, and they regrouped so that they could face the continuing onslaught of the Nazis. You might think of John Kennedy's words at his inaugural address. I can read them to you. Remember when he pointed to the moon? Pointed the country to the moon. <laughs> He said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. And those words galvanized the nation. I, I mean, his goal was within 10 years that we'd be on the moon. You might remember that, you know, nine years from that moment, Neil Armstrong stood on the surface of the moon and he said, that's one small step for a man and one giant leap for mankind. Those words were powerful, world-shaping words. We just recently passed Martin Luther King's you know, holiday. He had words that were inspirational for people. Remember these words, I have a dream, his I have a dream speech? He says, I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Those are inspirational words that, that move people towards racial justice, at least some steps towards it. We have a long ways to go. Uh, but, but those kinds of words began to shape a culture, uh, shape a society, uh, move us in a, in a different direction. I mean, being all of these kinds of words that I've just gone through, are, they, they are world-shaping words. They had great power, you think about it, to move people and nations in, in a direction. 
If we're going to talk about world-shaping words, how about God? How about God saying, let there be light, and there was light. Talk about world-shaping words. God's words, read Genesis 1, were world, literally world-shaping words. And then, of course, every word that came out of the mouth of our Lord Jesus are significant because they changed everything. Words are important. And, and honestly, some words, some words shape our world in positive ways, like the examples I just gave you. But there are other words that, that can, can shape the world or can shape the ways of people in the world in, in a negative sort of way. I mean, these are the words of the father who tells his son, you know what, son? You're not going to ever amount to anything. These are the words of the mean girls in junior high who tell one of their classmates, you know what, you're ugly. These are the words of the straying husband who walks in to his wife, the mother of his three kids, and says, I'm leaving you for another woman. Those words are also world-shaping. Those words are powerful words, but not to build up in positive ways, but, but to tear down in negative ways. That's what words have the power to do. They can go both directions. So we have residing in our mouths this thing called a tongue, just this flap of flesh that's in there, but it is so powerful, it can do terrible harm or it can actually do amazingly good things. Gary Thomas, the author of the book Holy Available that we've kind of been referring to through this series, he said this, let this sink in for a second. He says, God can, and he will use your tongue to shape the world. Every one of us in here has a sphere of influence. Every one of us in here have relationships with other people. And what we do with that tongue, what we do with our words, will either shape our world for the better, or it will destroy our world for the worse. It's that powerful. Part of the impact of our tongues, then, is to try to begin to understand how we can use our tongues. I mean, if you've read the letter that James wrote, you know that, that James intimates to us that the truth of the matter is that, that none of us can really completely control our tongues. The tongue is like this powerful force that, you know, without us, you know, somehow clamping down on it. It just has this explosive power to be able to, to do great things or to do great harm. He says, but it, boy, controlling it is a very, very difficult, if not impossible task. And so we say, so what are we to do? Well, that's why we're having this series. We can't control our tongues, uh, but God can transform our tongues. He can change uh, the, the way that our tongues are used and change them away from the destructive ways of the world and, and bring them into the, the good ways of the kingdom. I mean, what has to happen is that God has to transform us. Uh, he has to transform this instrument, uh, this body part, uh, so that it can have the impact that he created it to have. You realize, don't you, that he created your tongue so that you could speak good words to somebody in the sphere of your influence to build them up and to guide them and to shape them and to, and to move them into the kingdom. That's our calling. It's only then, it's only after our tongues have been transformed that, that they'll be able to give life instead of death. And if you look through the Old Testament, you can, you can find a number of examples of how God transformed the tongues of people, ordinary people like you and me. I mean, one of the classic examples early on in the scriptures is the example of Moses. You remember that God calls Moses and, and, and in this discussion, and in, in Moses kind of reacting to what God is calling him to, this, this enormous project that he has, you remember that, that Moses complained over and over to God. And, and he, you know, his favorite complaint was this. It says, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, but I've never been eloquent 
neither in the past nor since you've been spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. That is a great example of what God's transformative power can do. Not just to Moses way back when, but to, for you and me here. He can transform our tongues. He will not only help us speak, but like he says there, he'll give us the words to say. Now, how did it turn out for Moses? Well, if you flip to the New Testament and you looked at Acts chapter 7, verse 22, you find, uh, you find Stephen, and he was talking to the Sanhedrin. And one of the comments that he makes was this. He says, now Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was, watch, did you see what it says? He was powerful in speech and in action. His words were world-changing words. He thought he had nothing, and he didn't. But God had everything. God transformed his tongue. And Stephen, all those generations later, says, man, powerful in speech. Take Jeremiah. Jeremiah was pretty similar to Moses. Seems like there are a lot of people who, when they came to God, said, Lord, I can't, I can't speak very well. Here, here's, here's Jeremiah's similar problem. He says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. And then the Lord reached out his hand, and watch this, and he touched my mouth, and he said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. What did God do? He absolutely transformed Jeremiah's mouth. And his words from then on were incredibly powerful. Some of the words tore down things that should have been torn down. He uprooted things that should have been uprooted. But he also built things that should have been built. And he planted seeds that could grow and bring forth the fruit that God designed. I mean, it's, it's you know, that passage gives you this amazing understanding of the potential power of words. I mean, listen, do you hear those words? They're, they're words that would uproot or tear down, or overthrow, or destroy. Or they were words that would build up and plant. Those are powerful words. Those give us a, a, a picture, an image of what it is that God wants to do with our tongues. The exact same things. Friends, there are certain things around us, and you know them well, that need to be torn down, that need to be uprooted, but there are a lot of things that need to be built up, seeds that need to be planted. And that's what God has us here for, to transform our mouths so that our words become world-shaping words. And Jeremiah didn't, Jeremiah didn't have to worry about what to say or when because God was going to guide him. He said, I've put my words in your mouth. That's true of us. God will put the words in our mouths too. Remember Isaiah? Remember in Isaiah when, when Isaiah is, is confronted by the glory of God in the temple? Remember that scene? I mean, so here comes Isaiah into the very presence of God. And isn't it interesting? It's fascinating, isn't it? That, that the very first thing that happens is, is Isaiah thinks to himself, oh my I'm about to get atomized here. I'm going to be absolutely destroyed as I stand here in the holiness of God. And what was he worried about? His mouth, right? He said, oh, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in the midst of a generation of people that also have unclean lips. 
And what does God do? He goes to the, the fire on the altar and he grabs a hot burning coal and he touches the lips of Isaiah. I think that's an amazing scene, isn't it? I mean, think about the dynamics of what's happening here. First of all, Isaiah is confronted with the holiness of God, and what's his first response? His first response is to confess and say, Oh God, my mouth, it's unclean, it's dirty. And in that confession then, God does what God always does for those who confess, he, he not only forgives him of his sin, but he what? He cleanses him of his sin. And so God cleanses his lips so that he would be a fit vessel to bring world-shaping words to the people around him. And his words became incredibly powerful. We still read the book of Isaiah. His words are still impactful. And then we can't forget Ezekiel. God called Ezekiel to a prophetic ministry among his people, but the Lord knew that the nature of his people was such that he knew that his people were rebellious. He, he, He knew that they were stubborn people, that they wouldn't listen. So God prepares Ezekiel for what he might face, and he encourages him this way. He said to him, you must speak my words to them. Whether they listen or fail to listen, for they're rebellious. I mean, he, he's saying, Here, here's what you're going to experience. So he was, he was sit, really setting up Ezekiel for what his job was going to be. And then what's fascinating is if you went to on and read in the beginning of chapter 3, I'll just read it to you. It says this. It's really talking about how it is that, that God's going to do this. How, how is he going to give words to Ezekiel? It says at the beginning of this chapter, in chapter 3, here's what Ezekiel said. He said, And God said to me, son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. And it gives you the picture of the the word of God on scrolls, right? And you've probably read it in in Ezekiel before, but but he's really telling him, hey, hey, here, here is this scroll. I want you to eat this scroll. I want you to eat my word. And he goes on, he says, then go and speak to the people of Israel. So eat my word and then go speak to the people. And so Ezekiel says, I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. And then he said to me, son of man, eat this scroll. I'm giving you and and fill your stomach with it. And so I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Can we sing a song like that? (laughs) The sweetness of God's word in our mouth. And he said to Ezekiel, son of man, go now. Go to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. Isn't it great? Ezekiel didn't have to worry about what words he was going to say. What God told him is, eat my word, and then you go tell people my word. Well, I don't know. I think that's exactly what we should be doing. <laughs> it is, I mean, isn't there really a necessity that's built in here that we should be people who are feasting on the word of God? We're reading the word of God. We're studying the word of God. Last night we had a great men's Bible study where we're just pouring into the parables of Jesus. It was rich, powerful. That's, that's what he wants us to do. Feast on his word. Why should we do that? Because those are the words we need to be sharing. Those are the truths that the world needs more than any time maybe in our lifetime. So let me sum up what we've seen here. What we've seen is that God called four ordinary people to come and to be with him. And in his mind, his plan was that you're going to come be with me and I'm going to eventually send you into the world so that you can speak what I tell you to speak. That's, that's it. I mean, that's what his point was. And isn't it amazing that each of them came and they brought their mouths and some of them had complaints and they said, Lord, I don't know how to speak. He said, don't worry about it because I can transform your tongue. I will transform your tongue. You come, you come in humility. We sang that song about God loving humility tonight. Come in humility and recognize that, Lord, my mouth is dirty. Cleanse me, O God. Transform my mouth so that I can speak your word. 
to those in my sphere of influence, speaking to them words that are powerful and world-shaping. That's our destiny. That's what God wants from us. That, that, that's his plan for us, is that we would, we would speak and our words would create something new out of what there is. Can we do that? Yeah. I mean, we're saying to ourselves, oh, no. <laughs> Don't be a Moses here. <laughs> right? We can do that. Because God is the same God that Moses worshipped. He can transform our tongues. Uh, we, we can speak words that will transform, literally transform the people that hear us. And it might be by planting seeds. Or it might just be by our testimony. It might, might be by, by our praise and our worship. Uh, that, that people will be completely changed. Because God's truth changes people. We're changed he changes others through us. He, we can speak words that are, are like seeds that are planted. And we may never see the fruit of it. But there are times, there's, I can't tell you the great testimony that Kirk Madison could tell you, of, of just planting some seeds, you know, decades and decades ago in the life of somebody. And then, then finally, 30 years later, they come back and say, wow, you know what? You said this one time, Kirk, to me. And it made a lasting, life-changing, eternity-changing difference in that friend's life. That's a seed that was planted. And we're, we're not worried about the, the harvest of it. That's God's business. But he does want people to plant the seeds. And, and, and sometimes, let's understand, our words might be words that convict someone. We're words that call somebody up short to say, hey, wait a minute. You know, your brother, sister, you're going down a road that is destructive to you, destructive to others. And I'm coming in love because you need, to, you need to, to get your ways right with God. That can be a life-changing, world-shaping confrontation in love. That's okay. That's good. The Scriptures teach us to do that. It might, though, be words of comfort, might be words of encouragement, but whatever those words are as they come from God, isn't it amazing to think that our words are really God touching that other person? It's not you. It's not me. I'm not smart enough. I'm not skilled enough to be able to, to put these words together. God is, though, this God who transforms us. But you know, it's, it's a lot more than just know, having the right words to say. God promises that he's going to give us that. But if you think about communication, communication is a lot more than just having the right words to say. I know I've picked on my friend Steve Borgia before, you know, but he taught me this lesson years ago. You know, it's not just about what you're going to say, but it's about when you're going to say it, why you're going to say it, to whom you're going to say it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of dynamics that go into this, Right. God will take care of all that. He's big enough for all of that. I mean, I think the, the classic example of that is, you remember when David fell into sin, adultery of Bathsheba? I don't remember. It was a couple years that he was living in that sin. But you remember that all of a sudden, God taps a guy named Nathan on the shoulder, says, hey, Nathan, you got to say something here. And, and, and I don't know, God, God had to give him the words God said, here, I got a story I want you to tell David. And then so he remembers this story. And then a couple of years later, when it was the right time, God sent him on that mission, remember? And he goes and, he, and, he, and he's there and he's talking to David and, and he tells him this story about this, oh, this poor man, you know, his sheep was taken from him and, you know, it was really unjust and, and David just gets all wrapped up into it. He's, really, he's just pounding his fists on the table about the injustice of this situation. And now's the right time. God probably whispered to Nathan and said, now, tell him now. What did he tell him? David, you're that man. It just laid David open. But David responded. Responded in confession. What happens when we confess to God? He cleanses us. I mean, David had to live with the consequences of that, that decision for the rest of his life 
But God continued to use him. God continued to use his powerful words. Read the Psalms. Right? God-given words delivered in God-prepared time are powerful. They're life-changing. They're world-shaping. So you know what I'm arguing for? You know what we really want? You can look at all the details of it all, you know, the right words, the right time, the right, you know, the right motive, all, that, all those things that are terribly important. But I think really what we're after is just this, that we want to be a vessel through whom Christ's words can speak to others. I, I think Paul wrote that in 2 Corinthians 5.20. He said this, powerful verse. He said, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Now, did you read this carefully. As though God were making his appeal through us. It's more than just as though. It is as God is making his appeal through us. That's, that's what God wants. God wants our speech to be the, the words that are really Christ living in us, speaking to these people in our lives. That's what we're really after is that. I mean, the picture that I want you to have is, is, is you and me being just the mouthpieces of Jesus. Whether that, you know, that happens when we're having a cup of coffee with a neighbor or, or when we're speaking with our family members, our kids, our spouses, our, you know, our relatives, whether we're interacting with coworkers, I mean, isn't, don't we really want Jesus to be right in the middle of those conversations? Don't we really want our words to be life-changing in them? requires us to be transformed. I like what Gary Thomas said. He said this. He said, our tongues can't be, tra- can't be tamed, but they can be trained. The Spirit of God can, can work in us. He points out then another great verse. Therefore, Paul writes this in Thessalonians, therefore encourage one another and build each other up. Just in fact, you are doing It's a great acknowledgement to that church in Thessalonica. You notice he says, encourage one another, build each other up, uh, just like you're doing. That's a great testimony. Wouldn't that be a great testimony for Rise Church, for the Apostle Paul to write to us and say, hey, you know what, you guys? Keep encouraging each other. Keep building each other up, just like you're doing already. Good job. (laughs) That's, That's what we can become when we allow God to transform us. You know, the reality of thinking about our speech, God, God does not just give us a, a list of bad words and say to us, now, here's the bad words, don't use these words. Now, he does some of that, doesn't he? But you, you notice that what God wants us of us is much more than just, just the, the idea that we could talk such that we avoid profanity or gossip or slander. He wants more than us just containing the negative words that we all know. What he has for us is that our words would not just be containing getting rid of the negative, but doing the positive, doing the creation, the building, the the seed planting. He wants to transform us. And so he wants our tongues to be tongues that bring about encouragement, comfort, sometimes conviction, but he wants us to come alongside of each other and with our words bring hope and bring life to each other. You know, a little earlier in the book of Thessalonians, Paul said this, He said, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. I mean, those instructions are great, right? Here's another whole series. Here's another whole Bible study or two or three or four. 
where he says, look, look, warn those who are idle and disruptive. That's one thing. That's some one kind of word we need to be giving. Another is encourage those who are disheartened. The other is help those who are weak. The other is be patient with everyone. You know, it, if you look at those things, it's really important to realize that you can't mix and match these things. In, in other words, you know, he doesn't say encourage those who are idle and disruptive. Right? It doesn't do anybody good to say, oh, everything is fine when everything is not fine. And so what he says is, warn those who are idle or they're disruptive or something else is going on. He says, warn them. He doesn't say, warn the weak. Right? He's not saying, find the person that's weak, they're really struggling in something, come alongside of them, you know, slap them upside the head and say, you need to get your act together. <laughs> or else it's just going to get worse. That's not, the, that's not how it works. What does he say? Help the weak. The weak need someone to come along and strengthen them. Be with them. Just walk with them. See, people, these people needed words that are, would bring clarity, would bring guidance to them, bring hope to them, bring encouragement to them. I mean, you, you get the idea. I like Gary Thomas painted this picture. He said, you know, have you ever thought about how it is that, that you can walk into a room and, and by your words, you can actually uh, reset the climate of the room? You ever notice that? You walk into a room and, you know, people in, in the middle of that room, they're just, they're discouraged, they're, they're losing hope, they're losing heart. It just takes a moment and a few words and you can change the climate of that room. I mean, I mean, you can go into a, a place and there's, there's a friend of yours who's just beating their head against the wall. They don't know what to do next in the situation that they're in. They're anxious, they're worried, they're frustrated, with just a few words, you can bring hope and encouragement. You can use your transformed tongue to do what God wants us to do. You might find somebody who's struggling in their relationship with God. In just a few words, you can say, be still and know that I'm God. You, you can just give them a few words of encouragement that will completely change the, the climate of the room. But you know that the only way that we can do this is if we're so filled with the spirit of Jesus that Jesus' words just come out of us. It's the only way it'll ever happen. It's, we're talking about transformation here. We're not talking about, you know, just human effort to try to, to be better about the words that I use. We need God to do this work. We need God to transform us this way. Because what we want is we want to bring to the world around us, the people that we love in the world around us, the words of Jesus, don't we? Words that are full of wisdom, words that are full of praise and grace, words that are full of hope, words that are full of blessing, words that are full of truth. This, this, there's a verse in Proverbs, which is the best place for us to end. It says this, the tongue has power. It does. Tongue has power of life and death. What do we want? I'm going to invite Danny to come back up and he's going to play a little bit for us. But, you know, as I was thinking about what it is that we want to do in response to this, remember what worship is? All of us, you know, that we are responding to all that God is. And so God doesn't want us just to be hearers of the word only. He wants us to be doers of the word. So there's no way that we can do this word unless he transforms our mouths. There's just no way. And so I'm, I'm going to pray here in a second for us, but then, then I'm just going to put out this invitation. 
I think the Lord was just encouraging me to go this direction as we close. I brought some oil with me tonight, and Steve's going to come, and he's going to help me. But, but you know what I want to do? If, if, if you say, you know what, Lord, I really do want to have a transformed mouth. I, I want all of my words to be the words of Jesus. I, I want to say things to people that will encourage them, that will lift them up, that will, that will build them up, that will give them hope and give them life. But my mouth has to be changed. What I invite you to do is just come up and, and Steve and I are going to, come on up, Steve. We're just going to anoint you with oil. It's not a big time of prayer or anything like that. In fact, I've got just two sentences I'm, I'm, I'm going to say. I'm going to say this. May the words of Christ be in your heart and on your tongue. And then you can go. But I, but I think we need to do that as a, as a response. Remember Romans 12:1 that we've been harping on all this time? Romans 12.1 says, present your bodies to God. That's a reasonable service of worship. Be transformed. So I invite you to do that. Let me pray and then just come as you desire. And so Lord, I, I pray for us, Lord, that you would transform our tongues. And that then because you've transformed us, you would continue to use us, you'd keep using us, you'd begin to use us in our words to recreate your world in all of its original goodness and perfection. And use my tongue, O Lord, to glorify your name everywhere I go. So Lord, we come tonight and we wanna wanna bring to you our tongues and say, Lord, transform us, please. That we can we can bring the words of Jesus, the words of life to those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to come as you like.